Welcome to How Science Happens, a podcast by Wally Paxton, DJ So, and Doug Tree, professors at Brigham Young University. In the podcast, we bring you stories of cutting-edge science as told by world-class scientists and engineers from around the world who are on the front lines doing the work. We explore the highs and lows of discovery and what makes science such an exhilarating and frustrating process for those who do it. And because we're nerds, maybe we'll even learn a little science along the way. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How Science Happens. My name is Doug Tree, and my co-hosts today are Wally Paxton. Hey, everybody. And DJ So. Hey, everyone. Um, so today we're excited to have uh, Kevin Dorfman, a uh, distinguished McKnight University professor in chemical engineering at the University of Minnesota, uh, Minnesota, and my former PhD advisor with us on the podcast today. Welcome, Kevin. Hi, thanks. It's nice seeing everybody. So uh, just to give a quick background, so uh, uh, Kevin did his bachelor's degree at uh, Penn State in chemical engineering, then went on to do a master's and PhD in chemical engineering at MIT, where he worked with uh, Howard Brenner. Um, after MIT, he did a postdoc at Institut Curie in Paris with Jean-Louis, Jean-Louis Viovi, um, and then uh, started as a uh, assistant professor um, at the University of Minnesota, where he's worked his way up now to full and distinguished McKnight professor. Um, and he's won many awards, including Career, Packard, Colburn Award at, at AICHE. And I could go on if I could find, you know, the end to the awards on the resume. So um, <laughs> anyway, so we're excited to have Kevin on with us today. Um, and, and I just got to, I just got to put a shout out there. Go Nittany Lions. Go there Penn you go. State. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. you know, I did you my know, PhD I... there. It was a great place. Yeah, well, I, I, I recently got informally banned from the University of Minnesota Hockey Stadium because one of my colleagues uh, has season tickets and has invited me now twice to see Penn State play Minnesota. And each uh-huh. time, very quietly, I cheered for Penn State and each time Penn State won. Uh, How dare you? Of my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, um, so we're you know, we usually start off and, and talk about uh, the guest background. So we're going to start there today, but we may mix in a little bit of uh, how Kevin and I met and interacted. So why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Um, why did you pick uh, chemical engineering and why Penn State, Kevin? Yeah, so chemical engineering, I think there were three uh, reasons that I decided to do it. The first is the, the usual one that most of our undergrads probably tell you if you ask them the same question. In high school, I like math. I like chemistry. I but what could I do with that? And the, they said, oh, chemical engineering. So that was kind of the level of sophistication of the decision in, in that respect. Uh, the second one was I knew people who were chemical engineers. So you know, this kind of exposure and outreach really makes a, a big difference. So my uncle is a chemical engineer and there was somebody who, a uh, family friend who worked at the Roman Haas plant that was relatively close to my house. So I had seen like mm. factories and chemical plants in operation and was like oh, that's pretty cool. I wouldn't mind, you know, working on that. So you knew uh, a little then, about what you were getting into then. Yeah, yeah. In the sense, I knew what it would kind of look like. You know, uh-huh. the end job, like what this is what a chemical engineer might might work on. Um, uh-huh. And then the other was just we were. I don't want to say we were poor because that would be overstating the fact, but we were not of great means. Uh, and so the idea of having a good job when I finished, mm. that was absolutely on my mind. I spent a couple mm. of years in high school working at a convenience store, selling cigarettes, making sandwiches, stocking shelves. And when I got to undergrad, I thought like, okay, if this doesn't go well, that's what you can do otherwise. <laughs> that was a pretty, yep. that, that was pretty effective motivation uh, to, to do well. So why Penn State uh, has some similar ties. Uh, both my parents are alum, so that was a, a, a factor. But the money thing was the biggest one. So my mother had, a, my father was out of work at the time. My mother had a job uh, in an administrative part at the local Penn State campus mm. and mm. didn't pay very much money, the job. But one of the benefits was uh, tuition. And so mm. she had partial tuition. I was offered a scholarship to go. And so in the end, I was uh, paid 25% tuition towards my room and board. An excellent so, benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that 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 was kind of an easy call. Other places that had like uh, means based uh, benefits, it, it wasn't enough. Like the amount they thought we could pay was far 
out of range of what we really, mm -hmm. I mean, taken loans, but it was, yeah, that was a huge number. And it's tough to be an engineer and not look at those numbers and be able to interpret them. Uh, <laughs> right. So, yep. So, so, were you, so that, yeah. So were you born and raised in Pennsylvania? Yeah. So I grew up outside Philadelphia. Yeah. So Penn oh, State okay. was the, the state school. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then I, my concern was largely that I, you know, it'd be like staying in high school because it's a state school and you worry that, you know, you wouldn't escape the, the local community, but that wasn't a problem at all. I mean, I never a few uh -huh. friends from high school who were there, but large, that's a huge school. And so it's I huge. quickly met other people and um, it worked out. It was a fantastic decision. If I had to do it again, I would do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then how, how did you um, get interested in going to grad school? So it sounds like, you know, you were um, pretty clued into the sort of bachelor's degree level, you know, get a job. This will be practical. I'm interested in it, but it's going to be good paying. And you end up going to MIT and, and, and I know a little bit of your, of your background. So you did something pretty theoretical. So how did, how did that shift sort of come about in your, in your interests? Yeah, it's a good a good question because it was not obvious at all, like you say, from the from the outset. And Penn State has one of the biggest undergraduate programs in chemical engineering in the country, but a relatively small footprint in graduate school. It really turns mm -hmm. out practicing chemical engineers, mm -hmm. and the program is excellent at that. Um, I had a very influential instructor in my sophomore year, Ali mm -hmm. Borhan, who taught fluid mechanics and heat transfer. Uh, very mathematically minded. He was uh, a student of Andy Akrovos, who has a mm. big family tree in the fluid mechanics area and chemical engineering. Uh, so he taught it in that style. Uh, and that was very appealing to me. So I, it was more I wanted to teach. So I saw him in the classroom. It was like, I want to be you. Like, I want to do that. Mm. It had nothing mm. to do with research. Um, <laughs> and in the, in, in the course of, of undergraduate education, it was pretty clear that I was a lot better at math than I was in the lab. I, organic chemistry would be the great example. Uh, the, in the lab, it was self-paced. I can't remember how many experiments you had to do, but I was pretty quick at doing them. Like they weren't that complicated, like they never worked. And I would get something, <laughs> you know, I would get something else. And then I would go do the analytical. It always ended with an analytical thing. And I, and you, I would get some wild spectrum or something back from it. And then I would think about what happened, do the bit of, you know, the, the theory. I go, oh, mm -hmm. I know exactly what happened. Like this was at the wrong temperature and then it went this pathway. And the thing I actually made is this other one. And the TA was always like, yeah, that's right. I'm very impressed. Like, that's not what you're supposed to do, but like you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got to like the, the last experiment. I think I had like four or five weeks to do it. And there were one week experiments. So I did it. Of course, it didn't work. And then I did it again. <laughs> it didn't work. And then like I come back again and I did it one more time. And you had it was uh, I remember this because it was a. Uh, um, an isomer, so it had a left-handed or right-handed product, and you had to put mm. it in circularly polarized light to see which one it was. And I still didn't get anything. And then I was like, I just wonder <laughs> if the machine's broken. So this is the engineering. So you know, I go, I find the lab where they have the product that I was supposed to make. I get some pure product, put it in the machine's house. Not the machine. It's definitely me. And I give the <laughs> so now I've done like you know multiple experiments. It's clear I can't do it, uh, but I know like everything is going on right. I can even run the machine. It's just I can't make this product. And the TA looked at me and she was like, I don't think you should come back next week. How about we just give you an A in the class? It was something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was a pretty clear indication that maybe my talents would lie elsewhere. That, but I still did experimental work as a undergrad mm -hmm. for most mm -hmm. of it. And it was in like oil and grease stuff, which Penn State uh, was uh, pretty well known for the thermodynamics mm -hmm. of some of these mm -hmm. hydrocarbons in the, the 50s and 60s. And I was with one of the older faculty and they had ancient equipment and it never worked. And so I was like, oh, this is what experimental work is like. I never want to do it because it's so, <laughs> so rickety. And then right before I went to MIT, I spent the summer uh, with Costas Moranis doing stuff in uh, process optimization. Mm. And I was mm. like, oh, okay, this is math. Uh, you know, you use a computer, like everything worked. It was really interesting. And so, you know, I had a lot of experiences, I think, that primed me to go in that direction as a graduate student. So it's pretty clear that's what I wanted to do. That's great. So, so tell us a little bit then about um, MIT and what was your experience like there? And if I remember right, you did a lot of pencil and paper theory even, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. So uh, Howard Brenner, who was my advisor is one of the like legendary people in mm -hmm. fluid mechanics mm -hmm. yeah. um, and in like pencil and paper stuff. I mean, you know, doing very complicated vector calculus basically to uh to solve for 
the hydrodynamics of different objects and flows of that type. And then he did a lot of things in, in um, what's called Taylor Irish dispersion, which was what my mm -hmm. thesis was about on how you, if you have something in a complicated medium, how do you come up with equations that are simpler, like an average velocity? And then how do you figure out the spreading if you don't want to look at all the microstructure, you just look at it like a reactor and you say, okay, you can inject a plug into the reactor. It comes out at a certain time, should give you the residence time, but there's a spread in those times and that's a dispersion. So that type of mathematics was, you know, was very appealing. Uh, and Howard was not somebody at all facile with calculation. He told me that once you had to use a programming language, he lost interest in computers. He really liked machine <laughs> assembly language. Like that was interesting to him and then it got boring. So, um, so I, I did, yeah, you do what your advisor does, right? So that, yep. that was the reason for the pencil and paper mm -hmm. stuff. There was a little bit of, you know, numerical integration on occasion, but it was not, not of that, that, that type. So that's how I ended up doing it. It wasn't, you know, I thought that was interesting. Like that, that was so much in line with what I did as a undergraduate student and problem mm -hmm. sets and so on yep. that it was it for me. And I was very good at that kind of work. So that was a very appealing thing. It was like the equations looked kind of the same. The solutions were similar. You could do perturbations, like to look for cases where you have small numbers and you can expand around the case where you know the answer to find something that's slightly different. And, and I had, had advanced coursework as an undergrad in it, so I was like really primed right. to, to do that kind of work. So it, it was like an easy sell, very easy sell for me to go do that. So, so if, we, if we were to fast forward a few years when I met you, you were into DNA. So how did you get from... How did you get from, you know, Taylor Aris dispersion, perturbation calculations, pencil and paper to microfluidic devices and DNA? So is this all Jean-Louis VOV or what, what happened there? How did you get to that point? There's like three or four steps, uh, which I'll try to get through kind of quickly. Okay. One was, yeah. was my thesis. Uh, the, 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 way, the problem we ended up working on was one day my advisor came in with a copy of Chemical and Engineering News. And it was an experiment that Bob Austin had done. And Bob was like very influential in these microfluidic and nanofluidic DNA things. And he showed me the picture in my advisor. He says, I don't understand how this works. This can't be possible. And that was sort of, we were working on it. So it involved DNA, but we never had anything that was polymeric. It mm -hmm. was still treating things as essentially colloidal particles and not worrying about the fact that it was a polymer, but thinking about the transport of the object as a whole, which was sufficient for the things that Bob was doing in those experiments. So it was the right approach. Um, and then when I wanted to do a postdoc, I, I wanted to go overseas because I was, wasn't was married and I, that Penn State Park, just to go back to it, like I didn't have a huge debt. I had some loans, but mm -hmm. I was very manageable thing. And so I thought, okay, you know, this is a chance to do something that it would be very hard to do otherwise once you have more responsibility. So, so I wanted to go overseas. Pat Doyle had just been hired at the, uh, MIT and he was with Jean Louis. And so I talked to Pat. Pat kind of connected me with Jean Louis. And um, Pat's PhD was in some ways similar to mine. He was with Eric Schaffer and Alice Gast, and he was just doing Brown and dynamic simulations and wanted to go do experiments. And it went really well in his postdoc. And so Jean Louis was a pretty open minded guy and was like, okay, I got one American chemical engineer who had knows nothing about what he's doing, came and had a successful time. I'll try again. And Jean Louis <laughs> was of a simple. He was also of a similar background. He uh, had done experiments originally and then for a period was very heavy into theory. And when I went there was building out a big experimental program again. So he was also, you know, of the mindset to, that it's just science and we could do whatever we wanted. And, you know, they were doing microfluidic stuff there. So I, I thought that would be a good direction to go to get a faculty job. I clearly wasn't going to be Howard Brent. That was hmm. obvious by the time I finished. And, the interesting thing at, at Curie was that they, they made me the job offer. I took it and then the clean room burned down. And so they're like, uh, <laughs> we can't do the, what we were going to do until we rebuild it. But I was and I, I, I just want to come anyway. Uh, give me an office. I'll, I'll just do some theory first. And so I ended up doing theory and experiment while I was there because I had the, some extra capacity and, and some unforeseen motivation to do it because I couldn't mm -hmm. use the lab for like four months. So, okay. So you're, so you're there, you, you start getting in the clean room. And, and so is that, is that really where you start? So, so you said you'd, you'd been introduced to these problems by Bob Austin um, with DNA. So um, 
by the time I met you, you were doing separation of DNA in microfluidic devices. So if I remember right, this was before my time, but uh, mostly, but you had been looking at uh, DNA and post arrays. So you make these little microfluidic devices, and maybe we should be a little more careful for the audience and tell them about microfluidics a little bit. Um, but maybe, you know, and, and the idea was that you could separate DNA by flowing it through these microfluidic devices. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that problem and, and sort of how you got to that one? Yeah. So, I mean, Bob Austin was the first person in it, but mm. VOV was maybe the second. Mm. Uh, and, and Baba in Japan was, you know, second and a half or first and a half, depending on your chronology. Because what Pat Doyle had done there was, was the same, that same okay. type of problem. So, so, and how Zhang Li got into it was he was really big in just gel electrophoresis and things that were related to the original human genome sequencing and trying to separate DNA and, and gels. Um, and then in capillaries. And then when you want to go to really big DNA molecules, it doesn't work anymore. So something above like 20,000 base pairs, 50,000 base pairs, it depends on the parameters you're using. If you try to put it in a uniform electric field in a gel, they all move at the same speed because they move like snakes, it's reptation. And it's biased by the electric field. So they kind of slither like a snake, but they tend to move in the direction of the electric field. If they get long enough, they all go at the same speed. And so there was a way to break that by uh, changing the direction of the electric field. It's called pulse field electrophoresis. And that, that works, but it's like super slow. So we've actually been doing some experiments of that in my lab now. Mm. And mm. yeah, you know, you set it up and it's like a 16, 20 hour wait for the, the thing to separate because everything's just going back like side to side basically and separating a little bit in the forward direction. So it's super duper slow. And so the idea in these, these arrays was that if you took big molecules of DNA, if they coiled up and they were relaxed, they would make a ball and the ball would be about a micron. So if you're not familiar with the length scale, things of like the thickness of human hair, that type of, of size. And so the gels had holes in them that were smaller than that size. And that's what sort of forced the DNA to move like a snake because it gets all stretched out. Um, and these post arrays, you could make them with gaps that were the size of the DNA when it's coiled up. And so then they would move in their coiled form. But it turns out when they're in the coiled form, they also all move at the same speed. So that doesn't work either. But what you want to do is then have them get driven into the post. So when they hit one of the posts, they unravel and they look like a rope over a pulley. Uh, so you're, you know, the longer arm has a stronger electric force on it than the shorter arm. And it just pulls the longer arm down and it keeps getting better and better for the longer arm. And then the thing unhooks from the pillar. And it turns out the theory for that's pretty simple because it's exactly what you learn in freshman physics with a, with a, a rope. rope over like a the actual rope. <laughs> like it's like literally that thing. And, and so the time it would take for it to unhook uh, increases with the length of the rope. And so mm -hmm. that way you can get separation by periodically driving them into these pillars. And so there was sort of a game that everybody was playing of how fast they could do it uh, by mm. playing all kinds of tricks and how big of a molecule could you separate. And it got down into things that were really just almost ridiculous, like seconds, tens of seconds mm. to replace the 20 hours, right? To the mm. point where the separation was no longer the rate limiting step. It was like pipetting the things into the device and, and getting everything set up. Uh, and then the actual separation was, was basically nothing. So that was the problem that we were into. And, and the reason people were interested in it was related to the DNA mapping stuff, that they, they wanted to try to take these molecules from like out of human chromosomes and cut them in certain places and then separate the fragments by size. And then you could try to put that back together and figure out where all the cuts were. And so this was the original technology for, for doing that type of, it's called restriction mapping because the thing that does the cuts is a restriction enzyme that recognizes the sequence. All right, so I, I want to circle back and talk about mapping in a few minutes, but I want to, so I want to kind of get back to this, uh, uh, the background piece. So, so you're in Minnesota and so I show up. So I, I, you know, so I'm, I'm curious. So like, from my perspective, I had come to Minnesota not knowing what I really wanted to do. And I knew that I was kind of a, I knew I was interested in, in simulations of some kind. And I was like, I say bio curious. I was like interested in bio type problems, but I wasn't a really bio person. 
and I show up in your office. So what was your what was your impression at that point? In terms of the problems of, or of like of, the, of of me as a grad student of you know of what I what I was telling you I wanted to do. Anyway, I'm just curious what you thought, you know, your initial impressions. On that pesky just... student. Say say another that again, one. DJ. Uh, on that pesky student. Yeah, another, another pesky, pesky student. Stu was I just no, bothering not... you? <laughs> <laughs> Not, not at all. I, I, you know, I needed students, so that was a that wasn't a problem. Um, yeah, I, I would say and you you made a very good impression of of being motivated and thoughtful about what you wanted to do. You more so than a lot of other students. I think you had a a clear. You know, maybe you didn't know exactly what you wanted to do, and there are some students who are very narrow. You had the the right balance in that sense. Like it was pretty clear that that the things that were interesting to you were also interesting to me, and that would be a good fit. And it was pretty clear that we could communicate, which I think became very obvious in the time that you were here. That yeah, that, that, that was a, a big plus. That that was that was the number one thing I actually remember about our first meeting was like, I can talk to this guy. Like, which in retro, like at the beginning, I thought, oh, that'll be useful. And in the end, I was like, that was essential, which was, I yeah. think, really interesting. Yeah, that's the whole game. I mean, if you, for me, at least, I, I, I don't do a lot by writing. Uh, uh, until it's time when we're done and then we write the papers like it's not that mm -hmm. i can't write but that's not my my motivational way of of, of doing things is i we talk and, mm -hmm. and go around in circles a lot and, and try to get it out in the right way and, and that, that talking requires a lot of repetition too and, and to sort of get things focused and so uh students who are able to to work in that style are, are very appealing so so that was very good the, the thing you also said about being kind of bio curious or bio light, I, that's been a, a selling point for me and many, many students. Uh, <laughs> and the, the things that I, that I worked on, especially when you were here, were definitely connected to biology and could get you, if you wanted to go in that direction, mm -hmm. to do it. But it didn't require training in biology. Most of the papers that you were going to read were going to be much more physics oriented. But if you so were interested, you could do it. And, Later, I had several students, you know, really into some biology mm. topics. So I had, you know, we did some stuff with mammalian cells and trying to extract the DNA. And the, the student who did that is at Eli Lilly now. And like the last student I graduated that was doing experiments, she's a 10x genomics on some mm. next generation sequencing stuff. So, you know, th there was opportunities for people to do that. But then there were lots of people who came, worked on these things and went to Intel, was like the big employer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, because of the fab. And then uh -huh. the, the mm -hmm. high performance computing that, that some of the simulations required. So, you know, it was helpful to tell students when you come in, like, there's lots of things you can do from this. Like, don't worry whether there's a company doing like the little narrow thing you're working on. It's, it's skills and it's professional development. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th those things worked out a lot, a lot better. So the other question I thought would be fun to ask you, so, um, which, which I thought would be insightful is, um, we, we've talked a lot kind of in our, our episodes about um, graduate students and being successful graduate student or not being successful graduate student. And I thought it'd be interesting to hear you reflect a little bit on what you remember I did well. And also, I don't want to let you off the hook. I want you to remember what I didn't do well and what you remember, like, you know, me needing to do better or giving me correction or other things on. Which, which one you want first? Or whatever, whatever stick, you know, you smiled when I said what I didn't do well. So why don't you start there? I think you have some good ones. <laughs> yeah, I, the, the, thing, the thing that you were worst at was answering questions in presentation. Absolutely. So yep. you, 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 pe people would ask and, and you would jump right to, to trying to make an answer. And you often knew the answer. So that was what was somewhat more frustrating for me uh -huh. as your advisor. If we were at like the APS meeting or AICHE, and somebody would ask a question and like, not only did I know you know the answer, I didn't know the answer. Like this was something that you taught me or you explained to me <laughs> and you're just kind of worked up about the talk and, and somebody would ask and, and you would get a, some down the kind of the wrong track and yep. just wander but, in some wilderness. Yeah. 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 And uh, you know, that it's, it's, as far as things to not do well, that's a pretty minor thing, but you know, everybody has their, I mean, I mean, I think more broadly, I was not a good presenter, like, uh, or maybe I was a very nervous presenter. I was very yeah, uncomfortable. And I remember that, um, I remember doing my oral exam and like, I think my legs were literally shaking when I was giving this exam. 
you know, uh, and that's something which I guess now as an academic, I give presentations every day almost, right? <laughs> I mean, I stand up and lecture and, you know, I have a, I have a student now who's kind of a nervous presenter and I, and I've said like, you know, I don't know, after about 200, it kind of went away. <laughs> they did not like that, you know, but I was like, I don't know what else to tell you. Like after I prepared and prepared, I eventually uh -huh. just figured it out. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, was, I was also nervous at, at, at you know undergraduate level for sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, who isn't? You know, yeah. so, so did you think I was a nervous presenter when I gave talk? No, no. It, so, uh, go ahead. I was very so I had to give a talk while you were here because we have a promotion talk. So you have to give a ah, department seminar yeah. right mm -hmm. before your case comes up, which is like basically the game. I mean, yeah. if anybody wasn't sure what was gonna come out of this. You're sitting in there, yeah, you don't really know exactly what your colleagues are doing, and you go tell them what you did. So that's pretty high <laughs> stakes stuff. I, I do remember yeah. you talking about that, but I didn't, you know, I didn't remember I didn't remember you being nervous, but I can totally but, see why you would be. <laughs> I was nervous. I was nervous like standing in front of the room waiting yeah. for it to, to start. Yeah. Yep. But the moment it started, it's like all engrossing thing. Like when you know you have good stuff. It's really mm -hmm. easy. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know more than everybody else in the room. And that as a professor is sometimes a helpful thing. Like you, you've taught the class three or four times. So you're, you feel pretty good. It's not that there aren't going to be students who stump you, but by and large, you know, the answers to what you're talking about. And most of the questions yeah. you're going to get are the same ones that you got the previous year and you should have fixed the lecture, right? It's actually your fault. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're thinking. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, when you're younger, you don't, you know, you think your advisor probably knows more, but there are people in the audience who are in the field who may know a lot more about what you're doing too. And so that, that, that's kind of nerve wracking. But when you're, you know, when you feel like you know what you're talking about, but also when you know what you have is good material, mm -hmm. then once you get started, it's just like, it's easy. I'm just like so excited to tell them what I, what I did because I think it's so interesting. Uh, and so there's no real nervousness there it's then it's the end then it's time for the questions and then the nervousness is back again because i don't know what they're going to ask and i don't know if i'm going to you know be able to to answer it the other thing i'd say is you know once you reach a certain stage it's not just that you're practiced and you like have done it a lot but the impact of doing it poorly once mm. like so much smaller i mean i've given right you know you've given hundreds i've given probably ten thousand between lectures and presentations and and you know conferencing and seminars so you know the 10,001 if it turns out that it's not quite as good i'm not happy about it like i want to do a good job every time but i'm not mm -hmm. nervous that it's going to go poorly but when mm -hmm. you only have like two presentations or it's the right. first one you know then you really <laughs> want it. The, the percentage is so high right that you really yeah. you really care and that, that you can suck yourself out that way um, if you think, if you somehow can think about the fact that you may have to do this hundreds or thousands of times, and then you're like, well, this is just the first of a thousand. So if it doesn't go so well, it's, it's going to be 0.1% of, of my output. So what, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's it. That's easy for me to say, not so easy for somebody new to put themselves in that, that position. So one of, one of the things that really helped me, I think, and it's, it's related to what you just said was. Um, you know, you said, well, once you get into it, you're excited because you're explaining what you know, and that's fun. And um, that's totally true for me. And um, I didn't really tap into that until I was talking to my dad once. Um, my dad, for context, my dad, my dad's a professor and, and, you know, he knows I'm a huge nerd. And he, he said something, I was telling him how nervous I was to give a talk. And he said, like, you've been bugging people your whole life trying to explain these, you know, things that you like to learn. And he said, now you finally have a room full of 40 people who have to listen to you for 15 minutes. You think you'd be a little more excited or enthusiastic about it. And I was like, that's a good point. They, they're they just going to sit there. Well, you know, and, and that really kind of changed my perspective a little bit on giving a talk. So anyway. Well, and once you've given that talk, like you said, the 10,000, the 10,001 time that you've given a similar kinds of talks like it becomes a lot easier because you are in that comfort zone and and I remember one of the things coming here to BYU and, and teaching a different lecture every single day when I'm teaching an undergraduate chemistry class that was a little bit more nerve-wracking 
um, because it wasn't the same talk that I'd given. It wasn't my job talk. It wasn't my comfort zone, even though I knew the material. But but then again, it, it became a different kind of presentation and and there's a different set of skills that comes along with that. But but yeah, that practice, 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 I think is what makes that different. I'd almost argue that they're not different. And you know, one of the mm. problems for faculty or, or people in national labs who don't teach is that they don't learn that there's actually just one presentation. You're supposed to make it interesting to the people while they're listening to it. They should come away and learn something from it. Yeah. Right? It's, not, it, it's not that complicated. So if you, and it should be on time. Which you learn in class, right? Students don't want to sit there more than like we're fifty minutes. I don't know how long your lectures yeah, are, but yeah. that's kind of a standard thing. And so you learn like, okay, it's got to be fifty minutes. About twenty minutes in, everybody's gonna be a little tired, so uh -huh. you need to find a way to to sort of switch topics or put it, you know, say a joke or whatever uh -huh. you, you know works for you personally. It's it's not different when you give a seminar right. or when you give a conference presentation. It's all the the same. The only one that's different, I would say, is something like. 12 minutes at APS in which it's like, you want to get, get all the stuff in, you really got to <laughs> practice. It's got to be yeah. every word, you know, you have to pay some attention to it. But for like a seminar type thing, I think they're, they're just like class. And so yeah, I feel like yeah. the more classes I teach, the better my seminars get. Cause I, and you learn how to read the room too. Yeah. Right. You right. see the students and you're like, you know, they're, Every every once in a while, somebody falls asleep, and you're like, "Okay, make sure that guy, you know, you wake him up because he's like in some position. He's got his neck's gonna hurt." So I'm like, okay, "Now go back to sleep, but you gotta put your head straight down so you don't wake up in pain." But it's the same when you give your seminar. You you yeah. look out at the audience, and you can tell when people are like, kind of, they're looking at their phone, they're a little bit out of it, and when they're engaged. And if they're not engaged, you got to think about how to how to do that. So I feel like they're 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 very similar, and that's when I say ten thousand is more like adding up all the group presentations and all the uh -huh. classes and then you know recruiting presentations it's, everything right. is exactly the same thing again and again just a different topic yeah yeah so you start to see it from like the the bigger picture you're looking at like the 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 structure of a presentation instead of a structure of this presentation and yeah. and that helps yeah that helps a lot the other thing i would recommend if you have students who have trouble constructing a presentation the best book I ever read is called Houston, We Have a Narrative. Mm. And I can't remember the author's name, but I can look it up and send it to you if you want to have it. Um, yeah, that'd be great. We'll, the, we'll, we'll put a link to it in our show notes too. That'll be awesome. Yeah. So this guy was a um, tenured professor, I think in marine biology, something like that. Okay. And, and quit his tenure job to become a screenwriter in Hollywood. It was like what he wanted to do and became like he had a movie that, that was made and you know, it's a success story in the end. Uh, but he, the book is all about how academics don't understand how to tell mm -hmm. a story that people want to listen to. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood totally understands how to tell a story people want to listen to. And how do you, you know, do that? And he's like, it's not that complicated. Like if you think about all the movies, so he uses Star Wars as the example, you're, you're, you know, everything's kind of normal. Luke, he's working on the farm and, and doing, you know, the normal life. And then something happens. Inciting and then on an adventure. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it's exactly like the, what's the difference with science. So there's, you're talking about the literature and the way things people think about a certain problem. And then one day we discovered this or we realized this wasn't quite right. And it took us mm -hmm. on this adventure in which we figured out all this other stuff and, and in the end have some resolution. And the other thing he emphasizes a bit is, is putting the human element into it, that the mm. people do science. And so it's your <laughs> adventure, not the adventure of the, the atoms or the molecules. And so I, mm. I think that was a, a way to think about when you give the talks, like how do you, how you do it? And then it helps you to structure, if you think about something like Star Wars, how long should you spend kind of laying out the, the introductory mm. calm thing before you something happens and then, yeah. and then you start on the, on the path and to make sure that you resolve it and that there's conflict and tension, right? These all, they're, they're, they're elementary storytelling things that we don't teach. Yeah, you need, you, you need like a good Darth Vader in your presentation can really, <laughs> can really make it right. But I mean, I, I laugh, but it's true. Like if you can, if you can, in your technical presentation, find some kind of adversity, right? Like we thought it was this and this broke, and then we did this, like that really does make it interesting in a way right that's that is just not so yeah that's very that's very cool well i love that okay well we should um 
we're, we're getting a little short on time and I want to spend a few minutes talking about DNA mapping because um, it's a subject that's at least near and dear to my heart. So what, why don't you tell us a little bit about, so, so I always get this question when I tell people about what I did in my PhD, they say, you know, why, what, why not just gene sequencing? So tell us a little bit about, about mapping and sequencing and kind of uh, uh, what's the state of, of how we can know where stuff is on DNA. Yeah, so by sure. the way, what, yeah, what is a Darth Vader in this subject? <laughs> yeah, in, in the in the DNA one. Yeah, let I me mean, think, let me think about it. I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I we can definitely tell you where the conflict arises in the context of the work that I did with Doug. That one's kind actually yeah. kind of easy. And there's a there's a human trajectory. The whole thing is there. Don't worry, it, it'll it'll <laughs> come. With it. But if you need the the, the technical part, so in DNA sequencing you want to read every base. And so the holy grail of DNA sequencing would be to read continuously from one end of a chromosome to the other with 100% accuracy, which is a huge amount of, of DNA to read yeah. uh, in order. So if, if you think about like the, with the nanochannel stuff that we want to talk about and that type of mapping, like where was sequencing technology at that point? So we had what's called next generation sequencing and in next generation sequencing, you could get very high accuracy. So Lumina is the industry leader in this. And you, know, you could get a hundred bases in order with like 99.99 something percent accuracy, like basically correct. And the throughput now is unbelievable. So the, the, you know, to read the equivalent of a human genome is, is now just an easy task. Mm. So you can get lots and lots of these, these relatively short reads at very, very high accuracy. So the problem is that you need to assemble them into the whole sequence. And so mm -hmm. that's where you, you run into the challenges. So you can try to use another human genome, like the reference human genome, and say, oh, they should be here or another place. But it's not that simple. And so what you do in, in genome mapping is you have a much coarser picture. So you need to take very large DNA molecules. And the stuff that, that we worked on with the nanochannel like the smallest thing that you would use in a commercial system would be like 150,000 base pairs. So mm -hmm. compared to 100, so much, much, much longer. Mm -hmm. And they have things up to a million uh, in those systems. And then you put labels on them that recognize a particular sequence. And so that sequence in the, in the commercial thing was seven base pairs. So you would know where that seven base pair sequence uh, exist inside the overall sequence, but on a very, very large piece of DNA, but at lower resolution, you would know within like a thousand bases where it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so this gives you something kind of coarse, but allows you to anchor the sequences that you have onto it. So, you know, a way to think about it is if you look at Google Maps and you zoom out on the, the, the country, you, you know, you see where New York is and LA and where mm -hmm. maybe maybe where Provo is, but you got to zoom in a little bit and you get to really see Minneapolis. But, it's, <laughs> yep. but you know, you, you know where, where the states are, where the cities are, that, and the cities would be a better example. Like you don't actually know where in the city something is, but you know roughly where the city is located. Uh, and then the sequences are like all the street addresses. And, yep. you know, it, it, it's okay if you can start to put it together, you know, you know where to put that street in that city if you can get the kind of intervening part. So that's the, the big advantage. And many of the, highest quality human genomes have relied on mapping as one of the techniques uh, that, that were used in, in the assembly. So now there's what's called third generation sequencing and nanopore sequencing is kind of the leading edge of this. Mm -hmm. And these rely on different methods to get the sequencing than the, the next generation sequencing. And you can get read lengths, they claim out to the million base pair, like this, the wow. uber specialists can do this, mm -hmm. but we've done it. Uh, and, you know, just as a novice, yeah, getting in the 10,000s, no problem. Mm -hmm. So now mm -hmm. you have long, they're still not quite long enough, but if you can get that out far enough, you can do it. And then getting the, the accuracy is not quite with the, what was called the next generation sequencing, mm -hmm. but it's pretty good. It's, you know, well in the nineties. So. You know, you, now you have all of these technologies and you can put them together to assemble the genome. But where you still end up with a, a huge problem is certain types of what are called structural variation. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example. There's something called a, a tandem repeat. So this is a, a sequence of DNA that repeats multiple times along a genome. 
And there are disease states that are associated with how many times that repeats. And so, for example, you have many of them, you're going to contract this disease. If you have a few, you're okay. You could imagine this as a really powerful diagnostic. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only way to get that correct is by sequencing is to read all the way through. Because yeah. otherwise you have questions when you do amplification, is it just a bias? Or did you really, are you really able to count how many repeats there are of the sequence? With the mapping, if you have a probe that you can put down, then you just you know, read off how many times that probe appears on that stretch of DNA and you go, oh, you have 25 copies of this gene, so you're okay. Uh-oh, you have 30, you know, you need to, to watch out. And mm -hmm. I have a colleague at, at, at uh, Nubal Evanstein in Tel Aviv, and this is like a big thing that they've worked on is how to, how to do these types of analyses, which are really difficult to do still by sequencing, but actually pretty easy to do by mapping. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's try and tie that in then to this paper. So we, in this paper, we were doing a simulation of DNA in a nano channel. So what, why did we care about, you know, putting DNA in nano channels? What does that have to do with mapping? Sure. So if you remember the, what I was telling you about the gel electrophoresis and that the, you, when we were doing it in post arrays that the DNA could coil up. And so if you put labels onto, just take a piece of string, you know, and you can get a marker and then mark, you know, at various intervals in red, say, where the, the probes are going to be located. If you coiled up that, that string and then tried to figure out where the probes were just by looking at it, especially in a microscope, like a 2D projection, mm -hmm. you'd have no idea because you don't know where the <laughs> contour is. All you would see is, a, you know, in fluorescence, you would see a big blob that's mm -hmm. the string and you'd see some dots that are the uh, the probes. And so if you want to know where they are along the molecule, you need to stretch it. And so mm -hmm. when you can find the DNA inside the nano channel, you make it small enough so that the length scale of the channel is so small that the DNA can't bend and, or it can only bend a little bit. So if you want to be really mm -hmm. strict about it. And so that allows the, the DNA to be basically straight. And the nice part about it is that it's also relaxed. And so it's fluctuating under thermal energy while it's in the channel. And so the original idea, and this was again back to Bob Austin, it was his idea in the beginning, was that you would put the molecules into the nano channel, they would be basically straightened, but not perfect. And then they would be fluctuating. And so if you took pictures of the molecule at intervals where they weren't correlated anymore, so you need to know something about how long it takes for the molecule to forget its original configuration, each one of those would be statistically independent. And so if you were trying to measure the distance between two probes, if you took many, many measurements, this is like undergraduate experiment statistics, the mm -hmm. error, the standard error of the mean would go down like one over the square root of the number of measurements. Mm -hmm. So if you took enough measurements, you could have almost a perfect measure of the distance between those probes. And so that was the idea and why the nanochannels would work for that method. And then the other, the other reason you need the nanochannel is that you need to do this in a massively parallel way. And so you can use semiconductor manufacturing to make tens of thousands of these in an array and just mm -hmm. drive DNA into as many of them as you can and scan through that array in a way that would be impossible, say, by using optical tweezers, like putting uh, beads on the two ends of the DNA and pulling it with lasers. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very low throughput technique. Okay, so... It's very high throughput. So if I understand correctly, it seems like you like to stretch the uh, stretch the DNA in the nanochannels so that you can do mapping. That's right. Mm -hmm. But so I think it's a little bit out of context, but I think I didn't understand the difference between sequencing and the mapping. So what are the sure. difference between sequencing and mapping? So in sequencing, the goal is to read every base. So you need some type of measurement that allows you to do that. So basically, uh, so you try to read a G A T T C C something like that. Absolutely, that's, 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 that's sequencing. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's exactly right. And in mapping, what you're trying to do is to make some type of a probe. So mm -hmm. in the one that we did, it recognized a specific seven base sequence, or so seven bases that are in a row that are, mm -hmm. and and those have to be at a density that's not so high that you can't, you know, you have too many probes and you can't resolve them optically, but they can't be so dilute that there's no data. So you need mm -hmm. to have it rough, on average, one in 10,000 bases is a good number. But sometimes they get really close, and sometimes there's kind of deserts, like really dark regions where there's no probes. 
Mm -hmm. And then what you know in the end is there's this seven day sequence. And then from the stretching in the channel, you know how much DNA was between one instance of that seven day sequence and another one. And ideally, you know, you have 40, 50 of these on the molecule. So mm -hmm. now when you're trying to put together that puzzle, it's not that difficult. Like you, you, know, you try to imagine taking all the molecules and then just trying to shift them left to right. You know, they're all like stack them all on top of one another, the pictures, and then mm -hmm. shift them left to right. So everything lines up mm -hmm. and then that, that you add it all uh, together and that's okay, the math. Okay. Mm. Cool. So then what, what does this have to do with simulations? I mean, was like, you know, like uh, the most impolite question in my uh, thesis defense, why, why, did, why bother to do any of this? Why bother to simulate any of it? <laughs> well, so I, simple, sorry. I'm sorry about that. It seems like, Kevin, you have to ask this question to Doug because Doug <laughs> was your student, but right now the position is reversed. Doug is asking those <laughs> defense questions to his PS advisor right now. <laughs> Doug, Doug asked a lot of questions when he was there, so this is no, no, uh, nothing special. Um, th well, there's a couple of different answers that you could give. So the one that I like, because it was the motivation that we had, uh -huh. was that we wanted to understand the physical principles that govern the operation of the device. So this yep. is no different than saying in the 1700s or 1800s, you can make a steam engine. You don't mm -hmm. really need to know thermo because you just realize, you know, you can do these things with the steam and heat and cool it and, and, and you can get some work out of it, right? That, like you can mm -hmm. do engineering without science, but it's a lot easier to do it with science. And <laughs> in particular, if I go to the, the, the steam engine argument, you know, knowing what a Carnot efficiency is mm -hmm. allows you to know how good you could do, like there are yeah. limits to performance. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the theory of the device, how do you know when to stop working on the engineering because it can't get any better? So that was a, a very mm -hmm. much a, a driving motivation for doing it in a practical sense. And we were hooked up with a company that was trying to commercialize this. And our work, in my opinion, was very important to them because they could go to investors, but they could also go to biologists and say, look, we make this thing like we can do the biology, like we can do the thing you want. But there's also this whole peer reviewed literature explaining like why this works like it's not mm -hmm. magic it, it's just polymer physics like you have these mm -hmm. engineers and they're just you know figuring all of it out and it agrees with what we're showing you so you know yeah. that's a very if you're if you're on the other end and you're looking to plunk down a quarter of a million dollars to buy this machine you'd like to know that it's not just that it, it's an art you'd like to know that it's a it's a science so that mm -hmm. that's one like broad answer that I think covers why do simulation at all for anything. Mm -hmm. Most of it, you know, most good simulation ties into that type of an answer is that we need, want to understand phenomena that are difficult to do experimentally. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what's a practical answer, well, we did this for like, you know, a couple hundred grand and they found the same answers for like a couple million dollars. Mm. Because they they didn't know what, you know, they, they were doing lots yep. of experiments and very expensive, a lot of trial and error. So there's definitely an efficiency to doing simulation if it's feasible and it's going to get you to the right answer. And, you know, a big thing that we figured out was not the paper that, I, that we're discussing, but one a couple papers later where we looked at the relaxation time, mm -hmm. like how long mm -hmm. it takes for them to, to forget their, their initial configuration. And one of the conclusions that came out of that was that this technology would not work at a hundred nanometer channel, but would definitely work at 35. And mm -hmm. the company had realized that their original technology, which was hundred nanometers didn't work. They had a paper on it, but the commercial <laughs> one is, is about 35. And so, uh -huh. you know, to, to have discovered that for like probably 50,000 bucks, I mean, between yep. the amount of work yep. that went into that paper, yep. That's a good investment. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I, if I'm not mistaken, um, that project was at least initially an undergraduate. Wasn't that Wes that was initially doing some? I, I think, you anyway, know, I don't know if it ended up that way, but that was like part of the start of that project was like, oh, here's this little thing we can answer and we should be able to do this. And it's it's not our main question, but we'll <laughs> we'll we'll put that one in there. Yeah, it was it was a bit <laughs> of a side project. That's right. We had because we when you want to get that that uh, that time scale. It's a combination of like the fluctuations in the configuration, which are in the paper that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. And then the friction coefficient, which was in the next paper. Mm -hmm. And we knew all you had to do was put the two together. 
and mm -hmm. you forget the time scale. It wasn't a, uh, it didn't require a lot of extra work, mm -hmm. but it mm -hmm. led to a lot, a lot of extra insight. So mm -hmm. that was what was really, really nice. Yeah. Those, if you want to pick a problem, that's the best problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no One no you... work, huge impact. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to give you so we're so we're pretty much out of time, and I want to give you one last uh, you know if if you wanted to sort of say anything else about this paper about um so it's it's been I think the paper outside of one review we had that's been the most cited um, that that we worked on. I don't know if that's just because it was first for us or 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 what it was, but. Um, I don't know. Did you have anything else that that sort of came to mind that we've missed that you wanted to to bring up about the paper? Yeah, I think the interesting thing about the paper was to the people who were doing the physical experiments. They read the paper and go, oh, "Okay, everything's resolved." Like there was mm. this mystery about the uh -huh. like what should the slope be? The experiments were about 0.8, and we got about 0.8 in the simulation, yes. and we were mm -hmm. like, "Hey, it's, it just turns out that the theories are no good, and and if you simulate something that looks like DNA, you'll get the right thing." Uh, if you read like the rest of Doug's thesis, you'll realize that there was like <laughs> very little that was understood actually. Like this yeah. was not, the reason why it was, I think so well cited was a combination of being first in terms mm -hmm. of answering it in a way which was convincing. It opened up all of these other questions mm -hmm. and they all came from that that paper. And so yeah, uh, it was a, you need, you need to do, if you want to be like really well cited, that's the, the place to be, right? Yeah, you, to be first yeah, you, and in, interesting. Yeah, for, first and and create a sort of subfield where a bunch of people can refer to it and go, and there was this question and here we're addressing it. And there was this question and we're addressing it, right? And yeah, that's that right. was, that's very much what was, what was in that. And paper. you're not the only one citing that paper. <laughs> that's, that, that's important too. <laughs> Although we did, we did cite it a fair amount because <laughs> yeah. we, we because it opened up all of these questions yeah. later. So you, you still have to cite it because it's the foundational paper yeah. in the in the area. But mm -hmm. if you look back, like the, found the experiments are cited like maybe five times as much as that paper uh -huh. because they were even earlier and even yeah. more foundational. You yeah. Know? So yeah. the other thing I, I would say in terms of citation, like it's cited a lot for the kinds of stuff that I do, but it's not in science right. as a whole cited a lot. You know, so if your goal is just to get cited, Actually, the best strategy is to do mediocre work in a very active field in which it's very easy <laughs> to because because you can do a lot. Right. You can keep right. turning things out and people just cite every paper that's that goes with it. And it's a echo chamber. So you become you science. become part of that block of references that gets cited. Yeah, exactly. So that's not that's not a good way to do science, but that's a good way to get cited. Yeah, I, I'd rather yeah. I'd rather what we did, which was every once I, in a while we write something good and it gets cited, but overall I appreciate, we do science. I appreciate you decoupling those two things because it's not always obvious when you're doing that that foundational work how it's going to go right when you're when you're taking risks right when you're taking risks in science. Yeah, and this this was a tremendous risk in the sense that we had no money to do it. Uh, uh -huh. We were actually supposed we were supposed to be doing something else. We had money to do a different project. Uh -huh. uh, but it was with the Human Genome Research Institute. And once we figured this out, we wrote to them and we were like, uh, I think we should work on this. This is much more interesting mm. and more relevant to the Institute, uh -huh. even though it's you know different than what we had originally promised we would do. And we uh -huh. still did more of the stuff that we promised, but I, I want to take this grant in a different direction. And you know, the Human Genome Research Institute is fantastic in this respect because uh -huh. they want technology. They want things to work. They don't want you to do what you said you were going to do if it turns out that they funded it and then later that wasn't the most exciting thing yeah. around. You know, we talked about all these sequencing technologies. That's largely how a lot of this stuff came about was through mm -hmm. initially federal funding that to support the early stage work and to, you know, mm -hmm. allow people to say, I'm going to work on this. I have an idea and I have some, you know, skills in the general area, but to be open-minded to new directions and new insights that would come, that would, you know, we, laid the foundation for the mapping technology that was way better than had we done everything in the grant that we were funded for it mm -hmm. would have been good science but it wouldn't have really pushed the field in the way that what we ended up doing you know the right. Way that went. right all right so we have a we have a last question that we ask um which is so we you know we talk a lot about your background and and so the question is so if you had to go back and start over again but you were barred from going down this path you couldn't do chemical engineering at Penn State. 
you know, you couldn't work on genome mapping, what would you do? I think I would do something that's more societally relevant than mm -hmm. what I've worked on. And, you know, the things we've been discussing is genome sequencing, right? It's not mm -hmm. uh, unimportant by any, any means, but, you know, by and large, the things I work on are things that I find interesting that have good scientific questions to them and that are new to me. That like, mm -hmm. that's what I like to do. And so I don't necessarily pursue things that are important to the world at large. I train students who will hopefully do things that are important to the mm -hmm. world at large. So that's the, that's the output. Um, but if I went back, I, maybe I would look better for something that was more important as a scientific result in terms mm. of, of impact on society. And I think if I did that at a formative stage when I was a PhD student, I think that that imprinting would lead me to, to continue to work in that vein because the imprinting that I got as a PhD student was exactly what I described. My advisor never worried about whether anything was useful. <laughs> he only worked <laughs> on what he thought was interesting. He's like, don't worry about what other people think. Just go do what you, you know, what you think would be worth doing with your life and, and don't, don't, mm -hmm. don't listen. And so I, yeah, that was sort of ingrained. And if I had to think of like, what was a, you know, not a mistake, but a thing that was qualitatively different that I might do to yeah. not go down that path at the very beginning, I, you know, and I might end up back there anyway, because maybe that's just my personality. Like I would like, those <laughs> things. but to, to set the, the initial condition a different way. Mm -hmm. and see whether that, that ends up, you know, bifurcating into a, a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, our guest today has been Professor Kevin Dorfman from the University of Minnesota. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate your time. It's certainly been a lot of fun for me. Um, you can find out more about um, Kevin and his work. Um, and we'll put it in the show notes at anchor.fm slash how science. Um, you've been listening to How Science Happens with Wally Paxton, DJ So, and Doug Tree. As always, please remember to subscribe and give us a rating as it helps others find the show. And you can also find us and interact with us more and um, possibly with our guests on Twitter at Happen Science. See you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of How Science Happens with your hosts, Wally Paxton, DJ So, and Doug Tree. For more information about the podcast, the hosts, or our guests, please visit our website at bit.ly slash howscience. For additional comments or questions, we can be reached by email at howscience at byu.edu.